Hey, what's going on you guys? It's Aces High, and today I'm excited because we are finally moving into something that a lot of you have been asking for for a very, very long time. It's going to be the Roman Republic. I'm talking like Julius Caesar. I'm talking all that. So uh, I don't know too much about it. I know Julius Caesar. I know what Augustus Caesar. Uh, I know Julius and Cleopatra had a thing. It's pretty much it. Uh, oh, I know the guy was stabbed 23 times when he died. Um... Uh, I think it was 23 times. Anyway, that's about all I know, so I'm really excited to check this out. Um, I know that I'm jumping a couple hundred years, and don't worry, I'll come back. There's a lot of history that I've skipped and moved around, but uh, we're going to get into it, I promise. That being said, uh, I was actually uh, told that I should watch a couple videos before I get into this that will kind of tell me how the government of Rome at the time operated. Um, and these videos were suggested by one of my very first subscribers, LightX Heaven. Uh, seriously, he's been there, he or she, I apologize, they have been there uh, through all of my videos, giving me constant feedback, just one of my favorite, favorite subscribers. I know I'm not supposed to choose favorites, but they've been there since the beginning, and I gotta love them for it, so thank you, seriously. That being said, today we're gonna watch History Resummarized, The Roman Republic. Kind of, uh, they said it kind of breaks down the how the government worked. Um, it's a video by Overly Sarcastic Productions. And uh, I'm just kind of really excited to learn about this before I get into the actual history. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to shut up, hit that sub button, and let's get started. The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic. Part 1. I used to think that the old adage of Rome wasn't built in a day was painfully obvious and also distinctly uninsightful. Because honestly, at face value, it kind of is. That phrase is winking at you so hard it's practically wearing an eye patch. But if instead of just Rome the city, we think about Rome the culture, Rome the institution, Rome the sea conquering empire, that phrase starts to actually say something. Rome, as I hope this video series will show, was really special. There's I do have one thing right off the bat. I don't know the layout of Rome very well, and I guess it just kind of clicked away. Uh, let me click back. I don't know the layout of Rome very well, but uh, I thought that it was kind of like Paris, where there's a lot of circles, you know, a, a city center. Uh, maybe there is, and I just can't see it from this angle, but I thought, it, I thought a lot of cities at the time kind of were centered in one area and kind of spread out from there. Uh, but I don't really see that in the roads. Again, this just might be because it's too zoomed in on one section of it. Thing. Rome, as I hope this video series will show, was really special. There's honestly nothing like it. And I think it's important to appreciate not just what Rome became, but how much slow, careful, calculated effort was put into its creation. And as you'll see in a minute, early Roman history is a notoriously slow burn. Generation after generation dedicated themselves to something they'd never see the end of. And I just think that's really cool. That is cool. So, let's do some history. If we jump into our handy dandy time machines and go all the way back to the beginning of Roman history, we'll be looking at an actively on fire city, which happens to be Troy. Yep. The plot twist is that the Romans are actually descendants of the Trojans. According really? to Roman tradition, one specific Trojan, named Aeneas, who fled the burning city on the orders of his mother Venus to sail around the Mediterranean in search of Italy. This story comes to us most clearly in Virgil's epic poem, The Aeneid. After a run-in with Queen Dido of Carthage and a journey through scenic hell, Aeneas and crew arrived on the plain of Latium in central Italy. To make matters more Italian, the very first thing they do when they arrive is eat pizza. Wow. <laughs> We're not even two minutes in, and we're already establishing over 3,000 years of stereotypes. I can't even be mad, that's just really efficient. Fast forward a few hundred years after Aeneas to 753 BC, and the brothers Romulus and Remus, who were raised by a wolf, got into a kerfuffle of sorts while building some walls around their village, and Romulus ended up murdering Remus in what became the most Jeez. etymologically significant fratricide in world history. That, kids, is why it's called Rome and not Reem. Anyway, Romulus claimed kingship over his newly walled village, and over the next two and a half centuries, seven kings oversaw Rome's transformation from backwater town to moderately cool city. And even that wasn't a guarantee. Most of the action in world history up to this point happened in Mesopotamia and the eastern Mediterranean. Rome is all the way on the west coast of Italy. I don't think I can overstate how completely irrelevant Rome was in the broader Mediterranean arena for the first 500 years of its history. Rome, as we know, ended up conquering most of the known classical world, but a majority of its early history was simply a spirited back and forth between its neighbors. The Etruscans to the north, the Samnites to the south, and later on, the Greek colonies of Magna Graecia to the way further south. 
And by spirited, I do literally mean they were stabbing each other with spears. While all of this neighborly murdery business was going on, the city of Rome was building itself up both physically and institutionally, with walls, streets, a sewer system, stone temples and buildings, a governmental system reminiscent of the Greek polis system, and how many places had like sewage systems and these special built government uh i mean just i don't know things that you hear about in like the roman empire and and all that it just uh it seemed incredible some of the things that they had way back then that uh that we we now use today such as the sewage system i mean how many places in the world really had that at the time and a religious system reminiscent of the greek pantheon man that greek influence really got in there early all of this was going on all nice and well until in 509 BC, the Romans thought that their king, Tarquin the Proud, aka Tarquinius Superbus, aka Tarky Tark Superbus, was a total knob. And they were getting kinda tired of being ruled, so they kicked him out, swore never to have another king again, and officially created the Roman Republic. Institutionally That's speaking, cool. a lot of the mechanics of the Republic were already in place, like the Senate, the patrician nobility, and the Citizen Assembly, for instance. The transition to a Republic was really more of a reorganization of authority than a political revolution or anything like that. Broadly speaking, the whole idea was to take their government and publicize the power so the people could participate. And the word Republic comes from the Latin res publica, which just means public thing. Structure. Oops. The letters S P Q R embody the Republican idea. It stands for Senatus Populus Q K uh, Rom uh, Rom what is it Romanus Romanus uh, the Senate and people of Rome. The letters appeared all over and were a constant reminder that the Roman people were just as important to the state of the governing as the governing Senate. This notion lasted for the next thousand years through the Republic and Empire. It did was that really that true later on though? I mean, senators they lived pretty nice, didn't they? I understand that maybe they the general public was just as important, but the senators really had a lot of pull. The word republic comes from the Latin res publica, which just means public thing. Structurally, the government was controlled by two annually elected consuls. The praetors ran the justice system, and the quaestors, the silliest Roman name ever, managed state finances. The okay. aediles were responsible for the state of the city, so they handled food, games, infrastructure, and all that jazz. The senate, though it didn't directly legislate anything, published opinions on policy that were often very quickly put in place by the respective officers down the chain. Damn it. Ah, Almost all of these magistrates and senators in the early Republic were of the patrician nobility. If you happened to be one of Rome's many plebeians, you might have rightly felt a little left out of this supposed res publica. The yeah. plebeians, unsurprisingly, wanted political and social rights, and they were determined to acquire them. So on any given season of campaigning against Rome's bothersome neighbors, the plebeians, who composed the majority of the army, simply went on strike. They'd just go sit on a hill and wait until the Senate granted them the right to marry patricians, or to have their own government positions in special assembly, or to elect their own members of that special assembly, or to serve as consul. And then by 287 BC, the plebeians and the patricians were equal in everything but name. Good for them. <laughs> Institutionally, the Roman Republic simultaneously had elements of a monarchy, an aristocracy, and a democracy. This mixed really? constitution and its flexibility in governance, according to the historian Polybius, was one of Rome's greatest strengths, and I'm inclined to agree. Rome's institutions were its backbone for over a thousand years, and that's darn impressive. Okay, enough of the politicky stuff. Back to the stabby stuff. Now, like I said, early Roman Republican history is a notoriously slow burn. The struggle for plebeians' rights took over two centuries, and conquering the Italian peninsula was similarly slow going. Rome was intent on being careful, taking small steps, and taking its time. Recall how, in the aftermath of both the Macedonian and Mongol conquests, when you go too far, too fast, things tend to fracture. Rome True. spent most of the 4th and early 3rd centuries fighting with various neighbors and working its way down to only the <laughs> Bay of Naples. That's funny. I sure hope that Alexander kid reads up on how to responsibly expand. Yeah, we saw how that worked out in the last series we watched. Um, that being said, though, it's incredibly smart to expand slowly because, sure, you want it all. But uh, imagine they expand, they take this new zone. Some people won't like them. But their grandkids are used to being born and living in the this area now. You know, so they are loyal. It's just uh, interesting. That's a pretty short way to go in so long a time. They were being really careful. 
Key to Rome's military strategy was the doctrine of expanding defense. Essentially, Rome would never be so brash as to go out and attack someone. Good heavens no. Rome had the good manners to only fight in self-defense, and they knew that their gods would only grant them victory if their war was a just and pious war. But... If Rome suspected that someone was going to attack them, Rome would absolutely shoot first. Uh, defensively, of course. A preemptive retaliatory strike, if you will. And that is how you go on to conquer the entire world defensively. By 280, huh. Rome had successfully yoinked all of Samnium and proceeded to set wow. its sights at Magna Graecia in southern Italy. Magna Graecia, not being the biggest fans of the Romans and wishing to keep their land thank you very much, sent for help from Greece proper, and they brought in the big guns. Specifically, they imported the Hellenistic king Pyrrhus of Epirus. Pyrrhus fought two battles against the Romans, and even though he won both of them, his losses were so devastating that he bailed on the campaign. After a detour through Sicily, he fought the Romans again, lost, and went home for good. Pyrrhus' abilities to win battles, coupled with his inability to not burn through a third of his army in the process, is what gives us the term Pyrrhic victory. So, uh, good on Pyrrhus for eternally tethering his name to the military equivalent of pulling five consecutive all-nighters to cram for a test. Yeah, it's a win, but was it worth it? So with pretty much no one left to protect Magna Graecia, Rome proceeded to swoop in and colonize all over the place. And unlike those who employ the torch it and start over method of conquest, the Romans had a good track record of being kind to conquered peoples. Except for this next example, from a rather salty chapter in Roman history. The Punic Wars against Carthage. Part 2. The first okay. war can be roughly attributed to a miscommunication with some Sicilian pirates. While Carthage and Rome may have been destined to fight each other at some point or another, they ultimately came to blows on account of both being called into Sicily to settle a fight between the city of Syracuse and some rowdy pirates. Rome and Carthage kind of just tripped face first into war, and spent most of the 23 year long war not actually fighting each other. The issue was Carthage had been a long-standing naval power in the Mediterranean, but Rome had no navy to speak of. So Rome really needed a navy, and quick. This is another of many instances of Rome adapting to situations really well. Say what you will about Rome, they were immensely clever and had a great habit of taking good ideas, methods, technologies, and techniques from other cultures and using them to great effect. In this case, the Romans found a few beached and sunk Carthaginian triremes and quinquiremes and proceeded to reverse engineer an entire fleet of ships. You know, wow. just casually, as you do. Rome's first aquatic outings weren't all that fruitful, but at battles like Cape Ignomus, which is arguably one of the biggest naval battles in history, Rome pulled out wins. Ultimately, Rome won the war, claiming Sicily for itself and forcing heavy reparations on Carthage. They also decided to take Corsica and Sardinia because, screw you Carthage, these are mine now. In the decades <laughs> following, the Carthaginians, led by the general Hamilcar Barca, colonized the seaside coast of Spain, largely for the purposes of mining silver to pay their Roman reparations. Little did Rome know, Hamilcar, his son Hannibal, and the other Carthaginians in Spain were furious over losing Sicily, Corsica, and Sardinia, and had been casually scheming to completely destroy Rome for almost two whole decades. In 219 wow. BC, Hannibal sacked the Roman allied Saguntum in Spain, and Rome, defensively of course, declared war. Hannibal, the madman, proceeded to rather famously Leroy Jenkins his way across the goddamn Alps with over 40,000 soldiers and 37 elephants. Elephants! And while elephants aren't particularly scary to us, if you're an ancient Roman who's never seen an elephant before, that thing is a four-legged giant with two spears and a snake coming out of its face. Bottle... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as we saw in Alexander the Great series, uh, elephants were definitely a thing back then. The war elephants, for sure. Online, they're monsters. The Romans thought they were monsters. Granted, most of Hannibal's elephants died while crossing the Alps, perhaps unsurprisingly, but it doesn't take a lot of elephants to have a scary amount of elephant on the battlefield. I genuinely sure. can't convey how viscerally terrifying the mere mention of Hannibal's name would have been to a Roman. Anyway, after arriving in Italy, Hannibal demonstrated his tactical brilliance by immediately winning two battles in northern Italy through guerrilla and ambush tactics. 
Hannibal and his armies would proceed to stay in Italy, effectively behind enemy lines with next to no means of supply or reinforcement, for 16 years. The Carthaginians Jesus went up and Christ. down the peninsula, setting fire to farms left and right, hoping above all else for Rome to simply surrender. Two years into the campaign, Hannibal said, all right, screw this, I'm gonna destroy the entire Roman army, and proceeded to make plans for his next battle at the Roman supply depot at Cannae in southern Italy. At the battle, the Carthaginians advanced in a U-shape, with 40,000 infantry forming the front line and 10,000 cavalry on the wings. The Romans, however, had almost twice as big an army, so they felt pretty good about their chances. The armies met, and as the fighting progressed, the center of the Carthaginian line fell back, and the Romans pushed forward, hoping to break oh, the line. Oh, now they're going to be trapped. Except, at that moment when they all rushed in, the Carthaginians' African infantry and famed Numidian cavalry advanced on the flanks and effectively enveloped the whole Roman army. From there, wow. it was a bloodbath. Estimates are all over the place, but the gist is that most of the 80,000 strong Roman army was killed outright and the rest were imprisoned. The slaughter went on until nightfall and in one version of the story I've heard, the Carthaginians only started taking prisoners because their arms got tired from all the killing. It was oh the single God. greatest defeat that Rome ever suffered in its history. And Hannibal hoped that a shattered and dismayed Rome, having lost 16 legions in the entire south of Italy, would surrender at once. How many troops are in a legion? If uh, somebody knows, let me know. Rome's response was simply, see you next year and it spent the entire winter raising more armies to go out the following summer. For the next several years, the Roman army pursued the strategy of just bother him and shadowed Hannibal around the Italian countryside. He was still being annoying, but he wasn't a direct threat to the city of Rome, so good enough for now. But jumping back, can we take a second to appreciate the sheer quintessential Roman badassery it takes to hear that you lost at least 50,000 soldiers and then turn around and tell the guy who killed them to shove it and wait for round two? Because holy crap, yeah, that's that a good takes point. some serious coleones. Serious and massively suicidal coleones. <laughs> and speaking of, in 211, the young Publius Cornelius Scipio took up a generalship for the Spanish campaign, which was widely considered to be a suicide mission. To the surprise of basically everyone, he spent the next five years successfully decarthagifying Spain to great effect. Following wow. his campaign, he hatched a brilliant plan to take the fight back to Carthage. The Senate, thinking this was another suicide mission, told him he could do it, but they wouldn't finance his armies. So Scipio raised a couple legions in Italy and Sicily and hopped over to North Africa. Now, while Hannibal is absolutely a brilliant general in that he did impossibly crazy stuff like crossing the Alps, campaigning in Italy for 16 years, and wiping out an entire Roman army, Scipio's brilliance came from his quintessentially Roman ability to adopt and adapt. The Romans, above all else, knew a good idea when they saw one, and they almost never made the same mistake twice. Scipio studied Cannae, and he knew what he had to do to defeat Carthage. Since the Numidian cavalry was critical to the Carthaginian army, Scipio played into a Numidian civil war to get some of their cavalry for himself. In doing so, he had massively weakened Carthage on their own soil, and had nearly orchestrated their surrender when, oh snap, Hannibal's back. And on that day, history nerds from all around the world and across time busted out the popcorn because this is gonna be good. The night before the impending Battle of Zama, Hannibal and Scipio actually, supposedly, had a meeting. It's detailed in Livy's History of Rome, Book 30, Chapters really? 30 and 31. Just read it, okay? For me. Read it. It's incredible. First... He's not gonna tell us what happened? Or maybe I paused it at the wrong time. They're simply in awe of each other. Then Hannibal waxes philosophical about fortune, gives Scipio life advice, and asks for peace. Scipio responded, well, I was going to make peace, but then you brought an army here. I can't just leave now. Look, Hannibal, I respect you. I really do. And you're leaving me no choice here, man. I've just got to kick your ass, dude. I'm sorry. There's no <laughs> other way. I have to kick your ass. And on the following day, some asses were certainly kicked. At the Battle of Zama, Scipio's Numidian cavalry put the Carthaginian cavalry to flight, and fighting between the infantry lines was actually very close until the Roman cavalry returned from behind the Carthaginian line to ultimately win the day. It was a hard-fought and super tense battle, but with that, the Second Punic War was won. 
half a century and a lot of Cato the Elder ending all of his speeches with Carthago de Lenda est later, Rome returns to raise Carthage to the ground. To rub more salt wow. in the wound, the Romans also literally rubbed salt in the earth to make sure the Carthaginians would never rise again. Wow. Okay, so there's regular bitter. Carthage wasn't actually salted into oblivion. The amount of salt required to make that largest city barren would be impossibly expensive. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Duh. But the origin of the myth may, uh, uh, may owe to obscure Roman religious and military practices. The rerum repetio, repetio uh, required a priest to stab a javelin into enemy land when declaring war, but sometimes enemy land was far away, so Rome kept a small square of enemy land inside the city for just the pur that purpose. Are you kidding me? They kept a little square of enemy soil sitting in their per in their city, so they don't have to leave, but they can still stab the enemy's land. Wow. So they probably covered that. Yeah, they could have just salted that one little area. <laughs> That's funny. There's Taylor Swift writes a song about you bitter and then there's Rome hates you so much They wipe you off the face of the earth forever bitter yep. moral of the story is Rome does not screw around So don't screw with Rome with Spain and North Africa now happily Romanized focus shifted eastward and Rome proceeded to clean up the squabbling and stagnating Hellenistic kingdoms from the aftermath of Alexander the short-sighted's campaigns the Macedonians had helped Carthage in the Punic Wars and Rome considered that sufficient grounds for bespearment and bespearment of course is a word that I made up for the act of getting stabbed with a spear anyway in that conflict, the Seleucid Greeks helped the Macedonians, so the Romans saw <laughs> that, too, as provocation. Not wanting to go too far too fast, and also because they didn't quite have a big enough army yet, Rome stopped at Greece for the better part of a century and simply took to kneecapping the armies of the Eastern Something interesting is, uh, we just watched Alexander the Great. We, uh, the Greek states, I don't remember who would be running them, but, uh, uh, Seleucid kid, whatever, he was, uh, definitely... A, uh, a member that was in uh, in the battle of the successors afterwards, as well as uh, Ptolemy down here. So it's interesting that they're still around. Uh, maybe not them, but their kingdoms at least. Um, years later, because now it's 214. That's, uh, what, 80 years after uh, all that happened, after Antagonus died. Mediterranean, so they didn't pose any direct threat. This marks a much more aggressive Roman attitude towards conquest. It was super important that Italy be unified through kindness and generosity, because that was Italy, but all of these new places were explicitly considered provinces under Rome. Even though Rome was still a republic and didn't yet have an emperor, it absolutely possessed an empire by this point. After the conquest of Greece and the acquisition of the Kingdom of Pergamum through a will, of all things, Rome was clearly the dominant power in the Mediterranean. <laughs> now, despite Rome's best efforts, it was about to have some serious problems, a few of which derived from the Roman patron-client system, in which a wealthy and well-connected Roman provided for his clients, who in turn supported him politically. This worked fine on a small scale, but things got problematic when people effectively tried to buy public support in large quantities. In the late 2nd century, the Gracchi brothers attempted on several occasions to redistribute land to their supporters, among several other reforms, and when Tiberius Gracchus tried to run for re-election as Tribune, he was assassinated. A decade later, Gaius wow. Gracchus and his allies were also assassinated. Whoa, Rome buddy, hold up. You had no political violence for over 600 years, you got a really good thing going. Please don't screw this up. Oh, wow, yeah, they really screw this one up, don't they? Jesus Christ. The first civil war, so was that 135 to 132? 20 years later. Jesus Christ, man. I guess 30 years later, the second civil war. Or sur survival war. Uh, let's see. 10 years later was the social war. Followed by two years later. Then another four years. Then immediately... Nine years. Oh my god, that's ridiculous. Jeez. Yikes, where do we start? Okay, so, first there are three mass slave revolts in Sicily and Italy, then there's the social war where most of Italy revolted against Rome, after which all Italians were granted full citizenship, and let's also not forget the Catalan conspiracy to overthrow the consulship of Cicero. All of those civil wars were reconciled, but still, that's a lot of civil warring to happen in just the span of a half century. 
but by far the worst of the lot were the factional civil wars between the populist populares and the aristocratic optimates, otherwise known as the two civil wars between Marius and Sulla. Gaius Marius, a seven-time consul and general who conquered parts of North Africa and settled the social war, headed the populares, while the optimates were led by Lucius Sulla, another successful general. The optimates were the ones who assassinated the Gracchi brothers, and when Sulla came back from a campaign in Anatolia, he marched his army into Rome, established himself as dictator, and proceeded to massacre his rival populares. Twice. He did all of that twice. That's huge! In 50 years, we went from not a single Roman being killed over politics to armies marching on Rome and carrying out prescribed hit lists of political enemies. Things were wow. really, really bad in the first century. For now, though, let's recap. Rome started as one tiny, irrelevant city and grew itself very gradually through calculated means, first conquering Italy, then the islands, then Spain, and soon after Greece, North Africa, and Anatolia. What astounds me is that a typical Roman would wow. only ever see a small part of this unfold. The Romans were patient and they knew that doing things properly and working towards something bigger than themselves would lead to accomplishments far greater and longer lasting than the floundering conquests of a Greek kid on a horse. Damn. It's messed up. Uh, they're really burning Alexander the Great in this uh, in this video. Uh, that being said, though, the uh, it really is a slow burn. The uh, the expansion um, and think about it over hundreds of years. I mean, that's many many generations. So you just saw a little section of it in your entire lifetime. Part three. Ah, the Roman Republic, perhaps the ancient world's most brilliant form of government. It's had a rough go in its later years, but with the right people in charge, I bet that it could continue on for centuries to come. Like this guy right here, Julius Caesar, who I'm sure will do everything in his power to preserve the Republic. We saw in the last couple videos that as Roman politics got increasingly factional and Roman territory got increasingly massive... Well... Hopefully that song didn't just make this a copyright. Things started getting increasingly civil war -y. as in they'd barely be able to go a decade between 135 and 30 BC without collapsing into some variety of a civil war. It's honestly a minor miracle that Rome didn't permanently tear itself in half before we even got to Caesar. So as we push forward through history and get to talking about our old buddy Julius, I want to consider the question of whether the Roman Republic, not Rome as a whole, but specifically the Republican system of government, was doomed to fail or whether it had any chance of survival. Because our answer to that question really matters when we look at people like Caesar and Augustus and ask ourselves what they did and whether or not they went too far. But wasn't Caesar uh, just wasn't Caesar a title? Like uh, I don't know, Augustus Caesar, Julius Caesar. Uh, I know that they were somehow related, but uh, I thought that Caesar was specifically a name for a title. You know, not part of their name. But since I'm impatient, I'm going to give you my answer right now. To me, the Republic had almost no chance of surviving on its own. Zero. You saw what happened in the first century. You know what kind of mess Rome was in. I love the Roman Republic. It's one of my favorite systems of government ever, but that poor thing was so screwed. So with our sickly looking Republic on its last legs, let's meet the guy who took it out back and killed it dead. Julius Caesar. Now let's do some history. To establish what kind of guy Caesar really is, I'll spin you a yarn about some Cilician pirates. When Caesar was in his early 20s, he managed to get himself captured by a band of pirates who wanted to ransom him off for 20 talents of silver. There's no agreed upon conversion between talents and US dollars, but for our purposes, let's just say that one talent is about one million dollars. So when Caesar heard this Jesus. sum, he straight up laughed at them and demanded that they ask for a much more respectable 50 talents instead. The pirates, charmed by Caesar's overwhelming divaness and razor-sharp cheekbones, I might add, were all too happy to keep him around for the sheer entertainment factor. He played games with them, told stories, and even wrote poems and speeches for them. Sometimes they'd joke about his speeches being bad, and Caesar would respond by saying that when he got free, he'd come back and crucify every last one of them, which the pirates apparently thought was hilarious. Eventually, the pirates did get their 50 talents, so they let Caesar go. And then about five seconds later, Caesar came back with a bunch of ships and arrested all of them, casually taking his 50 talents back. He brought the wow. pirates to the provincial governor, but since he didn't really seem to care all that much, Caesar took matters into his own hands and took the high road by keeping his promise. And, uh, crucified all of them. Fun! Really? Moral of the story is... You know what, I remember something about that in the Julius Caesar video. I remember he was taken by pirates, and uh, he came back and killed him. I, 
I didn't remember that they said that he crucified him in that video. Jesus Christ. Caesar cares a lot about his image. He's amazingly no charismatic. He's not afraid to take matters into his own hands if he needs to, and he does not screw around. On to more historically significant matters, our boy Gaius Julius Caesar was a well-to-do nobleman from a prestigious family that traced its ancestry back to the epic hero Aeneas and his mother Venus. However, Caesar had a chip on his shoulder because his dad was never consul. You see, in Roman culture, the concept of nobilitas was rooted in the idea that you can inherit excellence, but you have to confirm it by doing excellent things in the present. So <laughs> unlike in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and the early modern period, you couldn't just coast by on familial prestige, you actually had to, you know, do something for it in ancient Rome. Caesar's okay. dad not being consul was a big deal, so his primary goal in life was to confirm his nobilitas by just being consul. To do it, he struck a deal with two other prominent Romans, Crassus, the richest man in Rome, and Pompey, Rome's most accomplished general, and they created an informal alliance. In other words, they made- Pompey, he said? Isn't it pronounced Pompey? Is that, is that, like, General Pompey? It's gotta be, right? The first triumvirate. They were all good friends, Pompey married Caesar's daughter, Crassus bribed Caesar's way to the consulship in 59 BC, Caesar passed all the laws that Pompey and Crassus wanted, it was a good time. In the process of ramming through debt forgiveness and land redistribution legislation, Caesar maybe definitely broke several procedural norms and did things that were straight up illegal, but since he was consul, he had Imperium, the gold Mario star of Roman politics, which meant that he couldn't be prosecuted for his actions while he was in office. Regularly overriding the veto of your co-consul wow. on the principle of because I said so, and filling the city with legionaries to dissuade your political opponents may be definite no-nos in the eyes of the Roman elite, but no one could really do anything about it. Anyway, for Caesar's year in power, he was safe, but once that consulship and his imperium expired, Caesar had a big target on his back, so he needed to find a way to keep his imperium until he was allowed to run for consul again ten years later. Conveniently, generals also have Imperium, so Caesar's next move was to secure himself a governorship of a province and the command of a few legions so he could go around campaigning with all the Imperium in the world until he could stand for consul again. Some senators, fearing that Caesar would do literally exactly that, tried to swap his guarantee for governor of a province for essentially governor of the Italian woods, but Pompey and Crassus, again, had enough power to overturn that. Cool. It's, it's bugging me that he's calling him Pompey. Isn't it Pompey? Or I, have I just been saying that wrong? Or maybe it's not pronounced that way and it's a completely different name. Coins and stabby things tend to get you a lot in life. But here we see just how fragile the Republic really was at this point. Anyone with enough connections and resources could effectively cripple the normal flow of government and steer it in favorable directions for their own benefit. But anyway, Caesar got himself four legions and a cushy governorship in southern Gaul, along with a metric buttload of military imperium to keep him safe, and set about campaigning in Gaul for the next ten years. It's astounding how much we know in detail about these campaigns, and it's because Caesar himself wrote extensive commentaries on them. This was critical, as he could justify his continued campaign in Gaul year after year by showing how cool he was and how great of a job he was doing, while also building up support among the Roman people by also showing how cool he was and how great of a job he was doing. Plus, hmm. we got a history out of it, so win, win, win. That All makes right. sense. So in enough detail that I can still sleep at night, but also in short enough form that this video won't be an hour long, <laughs> Caesar's campaign went roughly as follows. In 58 BC, Caesar attacked the Helvetii tribe on the pretense that they were attacking an ally of Rome, because remember, Rome would never be so crass as to attack unprovoked. At the end of each year's campaigning season, Caesar left his armies in Gaul and spent the winters in northern Italy. The next year, Caesar went north, won a battle, and got ambushed one time. In 56, Caesar claimed that the Veneti tribe had, quote, revolted from Rome, even though they were in God <laughs> Finisterre. So, uh, he conquered it. Safe to say at this point that Caesar functionally considered all of Gaul as already his. Uh, I mean, Rome's. The next year, Caesar went really hard on the Gaul is Roman thing. He considered Britain and Germany as threats to Gaul, and therefore as threats to Rome. So in the same year, he bridged the Rhine and attacked some Germans, and he sailed Jesus. across the English Channel. The invasion of Britain was honestly a total bust, so the next year he- That being said, Germany wasn't Germany at the time, right? It, I mean, it hadn't been formed until, what, the 1800s or whatever? Modern Germany? 
He went back with a huge fleet because the man can't leave well enough alone and pushed as far north as the Thames. After his floundering, humiliating scramble on the British beaches the year before, Caesar had to prove that Rome was no pushover to his enemies, to himself, and to his Romans back home. Oh, uh, also he lost an entire legion to an ambush in the dead of winter. So, uh... Wow. In 53, he went back to Germany and afterwards left half of his bridge still standing in a sort of don't you make me come back there power play. The following year was probably the biggest year of the campaign because King Vercingetorix had unified the remaining Gallic tribes against Rome. After some battling back and forth, Vercingetorix camped out on the fortified hill city of Alesia. Now, Caesar needed to surround and wall off the city to starve it out, but there was also the distinct likelihood that he himself got attacked while investing the city. So Caesar needed to fortify both directions. His army built a 10 mile long wall on the inside and a 14 mile long wall on the outside. That's 24 miles of wall that Caesar threw down because he was determined to take this city. But oh, oh snap, God. next thing you know, a ton of angry Gauls come down to attack Caesar. So Caesar rolls a natural 20 on his deception check, sends out a cavalry detachment to attack them, but the Gauls think it's the first of an entire Roman reinforcement force. So they panic and book it right the hell out of there, allowing Caesar to take the city. And just like that, all of Gaul basically belongs to Caesar. Boom, wow. that's how you do a campaign. The next two years were spent cleaning up the last pockets of resistance because, remember, Caesar still had a few years before he's allowed to buy his way to the consulship again. To complicate things, Crassus died while on a campaign in Parthia, and Pompey, feeling his oats, got the Senate to rescind Caesar's governorship of Gaul. So even the Triumvirate, which was supposed to be immune to the vices of factionalism, fell victim to the vices of factionalism. That's, uh, uh, that's not a good sign. So Caesar got Pompey's note, and astutely realizing that going back to Rome on his own was nearly a death sentence, Caesar, feeling his oats, said screw it, or more accurately said alia iacta est, and brought the 13th legion over the Rubicon River and into Italy. Pompey and most of the Senate proceeded to nope right the hell out of town and go to Greece. Caesar, huh. rousing the support of the people, was proclaimed temporary dictator, Latin for speaker, with the goal of restoring peace, even though- Really? Dictator? So I guess like dictator? modern day dictator uh really comes from what do you say latin for the speaker huh he was technically the one who started the civil war but shh, details and he proceeded to absolutely demolish pompey's army in greece at the battle of pharsalus against all odds and then he chased poor old pompey to the end of the earth which in this case was egypt pompey sought refuge with the boy king ptolemy who owed him a favor and was likely very displeased to find himself beheaded instead terrible way to start a so I've got a question. Uh, Ptolemy was here during Alexander the Great, but at, uh, during the, his his successors, but that was in the year three hundred and one or something like that uh, BC. This is, I mean, this is forty eight A.D. So what three hundred and fifty years later? Uh, what was he? Ptolemy the sixth, something like that. Does uh, anybody know which Ptolemy that is? Vacation. Anyway, Caesar was absolutely horrified to see Pompey's head, because first of all, he was a fellow Roman citizen, but also Caesar was planning on pardoning him afterwards, not killing him. See, this is a lesson in how healthy communication saves lives. But yeah, Caesar was super big on clemency. That was pretty much his thing, except for, you know, the pirates he crucified. But anyway, in addition to pardoning some people, tribes, and even whole towns during the Gallic campaign, Caesar pardoned pretty much Pompey's entire army and all of his supporters who fled to Greece with him. For me personally, that's one of the most important aspects of Caesar's character. And he was certainly a controversial character, but it's important that we weigh the good with the bad. He broke a ton of laws and sold his soul just to become consul, but he made moderate reforms that benefited the people. He killed a lot of Gauls and Romans in the civil wars following his consulship, but he granted clemency wherever he could. And he basically fashioned himself a king after he was appointed dictator for life, but he was beloved by his people and he used his power to stabilize Rome. All in all, he did do a lot of serious and lasting good for Rome's people, but that good was done through politically devious means for suspiciously power-hungry motivations. He's a controversial character for really good reason, and I'm doing my best to give you both sides of this right now so you can get a feel for some of the questions people like Brutus asked themselves when they were making plans to assassinate him. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, sorry. Ahead of myself. <laughs> Oof. Awkward. While Caesar was in Egypt deciding what to do with poor old Pompey's head, he was making moves both with and on the Queen Cleopatra, supporting her in her civil war <laughs> against her brother. 
The arrangement proved beneficial for both of them, as Cleopatra could count on Caesar's Rome supporting rather than annexing Egypt, and Caesar could count on Cleopatra's Egypt as a continuous source of food, which helped supply Caesar's generous public food programs. And for bonus points, by all accounts, Cleopatra was just plain interesting to talk to. So, win-win. Following Caesar's return to Rome, his position as dictator was extended to 10 years. During his time as dictator, Caesar managed to instate even more reforms that promoted public welfare, government efficiency. His it, dictator was extended 10 years. That just sounds so funny. Makes sense because it's, it's based off the uh, Latin word speak, the speaker, like they said. So it makes sense that uh, it would be a certain amount of time or whatever. But when I'm... When I think of dictator today, I think of, well, you know, forcefully took charge, uh, there is no timeline, and when they're over, they are in charge, whether you like it or not, you know? Efficiency and general stability. For one, he limited the political and military power of provincial governors, mostly to stop other people from doing to him what he did to Pompey in the Senate. He also reformed the monstrosity that was the old Roman calendar so well that we still use a version of it today. He also conducted a census, carried out several building projects, unified the Roman provinces more closely with Italy, and was just all around a really solid leader. Hey. Did he pull a lot of super mega illegal stunts to get himself to this point? <laughs> Absolutely. But did he make substantially beneficial reforms that the people loved? Absolutely. Okay. <sighs> okay, this is the part that makes me sad and angry. In March of 44 BC, Caesar was named dictator for life, and this made a lot of senators really antsy, because at this point he was basically king, and yeah, Rome still very say. specifically didn't like kings. I was just about to say, didn't they swear off kings completely, you know? What makes him so special? I understand they liked him, but... On the Ides of March, Brutus, Cassius, and about 60 other senators surrounded and killed Caesar in the theater of Pompey. Ironic. Caesar's last moments are rather disputed, but my take on it is that when he saw Brutus, his friend, whom he had pardoned after Pharsalus was a part of the conspiracy, he accepted his fate and fell to the ground, covering his face with his toga. I don't think Caesar even was eloquent enough to have fancy last words when there were 23 knives simultaneously stabbing him. No one is. The assassins may have fancied hmm. themselves liberators and restorers of the Republic, but they didn't count on the fact that the Romans really liked Caesar because, oh gee, I don't know, he was a generous and effective leader? While I may disapprove of Caesar's actions in his early career, I abhor his assassins. He granted them clemency, and they killed him. Dante puts Brutus and Cassius in the lowermost pit of hell for betraying their protector, and I'm with Dante on this one. Anyway, that's Caesar. Stabbed 23 times. Yo, is that a joke, or is that actually mentioned in Dante's Inferno? Um, it's a book I've never gotten around to reading, and I have always wanted to read it. Um, I just, I don't know, I've never gotten around to it. It's, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe I'll read it in the next couple months. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, let me know if you know. Times and left bleeding out on the floor of the Curia. Brutus and Cassius were able to read the mood in the room well enough to tell that they weren't wanted, so they and a bunch of senators hightailed it to Greece to build up an army. But doesn't end too well for the assassins, but I'm already into overtime, so let's wrap this up. In my mind, Caesar killed the Republic long before he was even dictator. He proved how breakable the system was. Let's count it. He bribed his way into office, illegally rammed legislation through the Senate, intimidated his political enemies with threats of force, escaped any and all consequences for his actions on a technicality, commandeered Roman resources for his own prestige and enrichment, marched an entire legion into Rome, and declared war on a fellow Roman for his own political gain. <laughs> the entirety of Caesar's main political career was either distinctly unrepublican in character or explicitly illegal. And remember that only after all of that did the Senate name Caesar as dictator for the first time. By the time Caesar was named dictator for life and functionally had become a king, he had long since proved that the Republic was fundamentally broken. For yeah. most of the Republic's history, its success came from fantastic Roman teamwork, but here- it, it seemed like he expanded it and made it better, you know? So did it really all, I mean, a lot of their history came from teamwork and their growth, but he made it so much better, you know? So it is, can you really say that most of their stuff came from teamwork and from them working together versus just him doing his thing?
Here, its downfall came primarily from the selfishness of powerful Romans. People realized how incredibly fragile and gameable the institutions of the Republic were when you stretched them across the entire Mediterranean, so basically one of two things could have happened to Rome. Either civil wars continued on and eventually ripped Rome to bits, or something in Rome's government changed to make it less susceptible to all those civil wars in the first place. Basically, it was monarchy or bust at this point, because nothing else could stop the chaos. While Augustus becoming emperor down the line was far from a guarantee, Rome's transition from a republic to a monarchy was inevitable if it was to survive. It's a little paradoxical, but in a way, Caesar saved Rome by destroying the then unstable and unworkable republic. He abused the hell out of its institutions, but in doing so he showed how effective a strong and stable central government could be, and this was the basis of Rome's accomplishments for the centuries to follow. Today, Caesar kills the republic. Next time, Augustus starts an empire. Hmm. Thank you so much. Really? I mean, didn't C Julius Caesar kind of start the empire? Uh, I mean, that's kind of how I always saw it. Um, and Augustus just kind of expanded it, right? I mean, I don't know enough about this history. Uh, thanks again uh, to uh, LightX7 for pointing that out and saying that I should watch that. It was kind of a summary. It broke down some of the politics and just is a very, very brief summary of everything I'm hoping will be in this next series that we're going to watch. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited. Hope you guys join me. We have one more video that uh, they suggested that we watch before we get into the series, so that will be tomorrow. Uh, but till next time, this is Asus High, and I'm out.